Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I want to begin by thanking my friend and colleague, Senator Boxer, for her leadership. It was two years ago, I think, that she began a climate action task force um, that took place at noon when all our stomachs were grumbling uh, for food, but provided some very interesting uh, advice, very interesting knowledge, um, interesting scholars that came to speak. And she was then joined by Senator Whitehouse when he came, now Senator Markey, and there's quite a large uh, number, certainly of Democratic senators, that attend these Tuesday at noon meetings. So I want to thank them very much for this leadership. As you have heard already, Debate over climate change has raged for years here on Capitol Hill, but the scientific facts actually have been conclusive for some time now. Most people I have found don't realize that greenhouse gases we put in the atmosphere just don't go away. They don't dissipate. These gases can stay for decades. Our actions, the greenhouse gas pollution we put into the air, and the forests we cut down are changing the composition of Earth's atmosphere, increasing the co concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to well above 400 parts per million. Just look at this chart. As this chart shows, uh, this is, these are global warming gases. These are carbon dioxide. And you can see how it's run quite along at this level. And then in the last few years, it's begun to jump up. So the current high was in, uh, in 2013 with 396 million tons of it. Going into this atmosphere, which has a blanket or like a shield over it, people don't know this. And so all these gases remain in our atmosphere year after year, decade after decade, and century after century. This change is altering how our atmosphere interacts with massive amounts of solar energy radiating out from the center of our solar system. Within the scientific community, Earth's blanket, our atmosphere, is getting more effective at trapping heat. The full effects of this stronger blanket or shield or whatever you want to call it must be projected into the future. And different projections show different effects. But we know this. Change is coming, and it has already begun. Now, a lot of people also believe that our Earth is immutable, that we can't destroy it, that it can't change. They assume that our planet has always been pretty much the same. But the last time Earth's atmosphere contained 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide was more than 3 million years ago, when horses and camels lived in the high Arctic in conditions that averaged 18 degrees warmer than today. Seas were at least 30 feet higher, at a level that today would inundate major cities around the world and flood the homes of a quarter of the United States population. Concentrations of carbon dioxide have risen, as I said, from the 280 parts per million to more than 400 parts per million in just the last 150 years. Now, scientists tell us there's no known geologic period in which concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have increased as quickly. Bottom line, never has our planet faced a faster or more ecologically devastating change. To settle the scientific debate over climate change, the Bush administration appointed a National Academy of Sciences Blue Ribbon Panel. The group, which included former climate change deniers, reported to Congress in 2001 that greenhouse gases are, quote, causing surface air temperatures and subsurface ocean temperatures to rise, end quote. Temperatures are, in fact, rising, they said. Then the United Nations created its Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 
a group of more than 600 leading scientific experts. And what did they say? What they said, and I quote, the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And since 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. Average temperatures over land and ocean surfaces globally have increased 1.53 degrees Fahrenheit from 1980 to 2012, with the highest rate of increase in the past three decades. Just look at this. See how the, this line is carbon dioxide concentration. Look at it here. Now watch it, the temperatures are still down. Watch the line start to go up and watch the climate warm to where it is today. They said the atmosphere and ocean have warmed, the amounts of snow and ice have diminished, sea level has risen, and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have increased. This makes that clear. If we don't reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, the National Research Council predicts the average global temperatures will increase by as much as 11 and a half degrees, 11 and a half degrees by 2100. Such a dramatic and rapid increase would be catastrophic to our planet Earth. It would change our world permanently. As temperatures have increased, we've seen that ice sheets that cover the North and South Poles have begun melting. The average annual Arctic sea ice area has decreased more than 20% since 1979. That's when satellite records became available. The Greenland ice sheet has melted by nearly 30%. And here you see it. Uh, you see the Arctic. You see the way it was in 1979. And you see what's been lost and what's left. The melting of glaciers and ice caps, along with expansion of ocean water due to the increase in temperature, have caused the global sea level to rise by eight inches since 1870, with over two inches in the past 20 years. If we do nothing to stop climate change, scientific models project that there's a real possibility of sea level increasing by as much as four feet by the end of this century. Four feet. Now what would four feet do? At risk are nearly 2.6 million homes located less than four feet above high tide nationwide. Let me speak about my home state, California. We have, within those four feet, the homes of 450,000 people, 30 coastal power plants with generating capacity of 10 gigawatts, 22 wastewater treatment plants with capacity of 325 million gallons per day, 3,500 miles of roadway, 200 miles of railway, 140 schools, 55 hospitals, and other healthcare facilities. These could all be inundated by the end of the century. Oakland and San Francisco International Airports are susceptible to flooding, and both are today studying expensive new levee systems to hold back the tides. Sea level rise in California would also cause flooding of low-lying areas, loss of coastal wetlands, such as portions of the Bay Delta, erosion of cliffs and beaches, and saltwater contamination of drinking water. Bottom line, rising seas puts California's homes, public facilities, and environmental resources in great peril. And adapting to this change will impose great cost. Temperatures in California have increased 1.25 degrees Fahrenheit over the past four decades. Now, the warmer climate could be particularly devastating to us, where threats from catastrophic wildfire, reduction in water resources, will likely make sunny California a desert state. The Sierra Nevada snowpack 
and we're hearing a lot about that now, which includes Lake Tahoe, is the state's largest source of water for 38 million people. It equals about half the storage capacity of all of California's man-made reservoirs. <clears throat> if we do nothing, the Sierra Nevada spring snowpack could drop by as much as 60 to 80 percent by the end of the century, eliminating the water source for nearly 16 million people. Only four states have populations that large as 16. And the largest agricultural state in the United States, California needs water resources to farm and grow crops. The 38 million people living in our state also need water to drink, to bathe, to, to f water flowers, for business to flourish. Major fire is another danger because of the size, severity, duration, and frequency of fires are greatly influenced by climate. This is the Rim Fire, not too long ago. It gives you an idea of how things burn. Fire seasons in the West are starting sooner. They are lasting longer. The average length has increased by 78 days since 1970 a 64% increase. That is in coincidence. And climate change is suspected as a key mechanism for that change. The change is apparent. During a recent Senate hearing, United States Forest Service Chief Tidwell testified, and I quote, on average, wildfires burn twice as many acres each year, each year as compared to 40 years ago. And there are, on average, seven times as many fires, over 10,000 acres per year. Seven times more fires over 10,000 acres. I believe this. We cannot stop climate change from happening. We do not have a silver bullet. There is no action we can take to stem the tide. But if we can hold the warming to less than two degrees Celsius, we can accommodate for it. But if the warning reaches five to nine degrees Celsius, the effects are catastrophic for our planet Earth. Dramatic and catastrophic effects are far more likely. Through a series of incremental but somewhat aggressive policy steps, we can slow the change. The combustion of fossil fuel, coal, oil, and natural gas accounts for 78% of greenhouse gas emissions in our country today. Most of the fossil fuel emissions come from the smokestacks of our power plants and the tailpipes of our vehicles. Bottom line, to address climate change, we must take steps to use fossil fuel more efficiently. And we must initiate a shift away from fossil fuel where we can and toward cleaner alternatives. I believe we can attack this problem by establishing aggressive fuel economy standards to reduce emissions from the transportation sector, enabling a shift to renewable sources of power, lifting the emissions from stationary sources, especially, excuse me, limiting the emissions from stationary sources, especially power plants, and most importantly, putting a price on heat-trapping carbon pollution. Let me mention some steps we've taken, because we have begun a transition to a cleaner energy economy. The good news is that carbon dioxide emissions have dropped 12 percent since 2005, due in part to the policies we have adopted. One of my proudest achievements was working with Senator Snow, Inouye, Stevens, Cantwell, Lott, Dorgan, Corker, Carper, and many others in the 2007 10 in 10 Fuel Economy Act, raising the corporate average fuel economy, known as CAFE, at the maximum achievable rate. Well, let me tell you what these new standards mean. They mean that 
we will have a fleet-wide average of 54.4.5 miles per gallon in 2025. These standards will cut greenhouse gas emissions from cars and light trucks in half by 2025, reducing emissions by 6 million, excuse me, 6 billion metric tons over the life of the program, more than the total amount of carbon dioxide emitted by the United States in 2010. Better yet, these standards will save American families more than $1.7 trillion in fuel costs, resulting in average fuel savings of more than $8,000 per vehicle. And our legislation also directed the administration to establish the first ever fuel economy standards for buses, delivery trucks, and long haul 18 wheelers. The first standards, which apply to trucks and buses built from 2014 to 18, will reduce greenhouse gas pollution by approximately 270 metric tons. I'm very sorry that Senator Snow isn't here today because I began this effort with a simple sense of the Senate resolution in 1993 with Senator Slade Gorton from Washington, Senator, uh, oh, I just slipped, uh, in my mind has just slipped his name, uh, from I think Nevada, and myself. And we couldn't get a simple statement um, passed. We then tried an SUV loophole closer, which was to bring SUVs down to the mileage of sedans, and we couldn't do this. We then did the 10 and 10, and we didn't think it was gonna go anywhere. And Senator Stevens and Senator Inouye put it in a Commerce Committee bill. Senator Stevens changed his view on it, put it in a Commerce Committee bill, and it swept through the Senate and through the House, it was signed by the President, and is now the law today. Today, President Obama has made completing CAFE standards for trucks built after 2018, which are required by our 2007 law, a key part of his climate action plan. Power plants are our largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions. It's fair, it's fair to say that federal tax incentives and financing state mandates, federally funded research, and a dramatically improving permitting process have led to a recent shift away from coal-fired power plants and toward renewable energy and lower emission natural gas. Additionally, renewable energy production has more than doubled since 2008, and it continues to boom. This year, excuse me, last year, 4,751 megawatts of solar were installed nationwide. That's a 41% increase over the previous year. And power plant carbon dioxide emissions have dropped 17% since 2005. So the lesson here is clear. We must continue the policies that are working, such as the wind and geothermal production tax credits the solar investment tax credit, and a project permitting process that advances projects on disturbed and less sensitive lands expeditiously. But we must also take longer steps to ensure that power plant emissions continue to drop. I support the President's plan to use Clean Air Act authorities to limit greenhouse gas emissions the Supreme Court's landmark global warming case, Massachusetts versus EPA, found that these gases are pollutants with the potential to endanger human health and welfare. And President Obama and EPA have an obligation to comply with these directives to limit such emissions. So I very much look forward to the President advancing a strong rule that will use market-based mechanisms. I also believe that Congress could act 
to reduce greenhouse emissions from power plants by putting an explicit price on pollution. And it's taken me a long time to get there, approximately 20 years. I supported various other mechanisms and will continue to support. But I am convinced, based on information by the Department of Energy, that a fee on greenhouse gas emissions from power plants, starting at only $10 per ton, could reduce emissions 70 to 80 percent by 2050, if the fee steadily increases over time. This is the emissions reduction level experts say is necessary to stabilize the climate at less than two degrees Celsius, warmer than today. If we can do this, we save the planet Earth. If the climate goes five to nine degrees warmer by the end of the century, we've lost. Such a fee could be responsive to emissions performance. If emissions were fa falling, consistent with science-based emissions targets, the fee would not have to go up every year. It is estimated that a fee on power plant emissions would be nearly as effective in reducing heat-trapping emissions as an economy-wide fee. The difference is 2 percent. So both policies deserve consideration. Such a fee would provide industry with cost certainty. And the revenues, exceeding $20 billion annually, could help address our nation's debt. They should go back to the general fund. The revenue could finance other important national priorities, such as tax reform, income inequality, energy, research, development. An MIT study found that if the fee revenues were used to cut other taxes or maintain spending for social programs, let me quote from this. The economy will be better off with the carbon fee than if we have to keep other taxes high or cut programs to run, to rein in the deficit. End quote. Let me conclude. Science has clearly shown that the planet is warming, and now at a faster rate than ever. We know this. Now, we as leaders must make a choice. Do we act? Do we lead? Do we tackle the problem, or do we wait until it's too late? Do we continue the progress we've made on fuel economy by taking on other large emitters? Or do we simply claim it's impossible, it's intractable, we can't do anything about it? Do we blame the problem on China? And China has a big problem. Do we deny undeniable facts during, due to current politics? I believe we have an obligation to lead and there's no question it's difficult, and there's no question that they're hard choices. But we have an obligation to control our own pollution. Our nation has the opportunity to demonstrate to the rest of the world that it can be done, and tonight shows that there are some leaders. I want to thank Senator Boxer, Senator Whitehouse, Senator Markey, Senator Schatz for their leadership not only on this evening, but for the years they have led on this issue. So let's get it done. And before, oh, before I end this speech, I would like to note that the young man sitting next to me, my legislative assistant, is leaving to uh, go and work for the Department of Energy and he has worked on fuel efficiency standards, climate change, energy, transportation, and a number of other issues. So, Matt Nelson, I want you to know that your expertise, your unique creativity and capacity, and your dedication will be missed. Thank you very much, Madam President.